The last time the Oklahoma Sooners took to the field, it was about nine months ago. Their head coach was Bob Stoops. And unless you knew something that I didn't at the time, nobody in Sooner Nation could have ever envisioned that that game, the Sugar Bowl against Auburn, would have been his last. Would have been comical to have even thought that. But as a result, it wasn't comedy. It was reality. As two months ago, Stoops decided to call it quits after 19 seasons at the helm. And it was the longest consecutive coaching tenure of any FBS coach. So the Sooners go from that to now the youngest head coach in Lincoln Riley, who will turn 34 on September the 7th. Now, you know, Riley was a former quarterback himself, the pride of Muleshoe, Texas, the Muleshoe Mules High School in West Texas. And, of course, you know, was a QB at uh, Texas Tech, graduate assistant under Mike Leach. And this decade, five years as the offensive coordinator of those prolific offenses of East Carolina under head coach Ruffin McNeil. We'll talk more about Ruffin later. And for the last two years, you know, Lincoln's been responsible for the offense for the Sooners and has done quite well, including last year, in which the Sooners were third in the nation in scoring at 41 points per game. And the thing I want to know about Lincoln Riley, even though I think he's going to be a good coach, um, how will the Sooners respond when facing adverse times on the field? In other words, when they lose a game, okay? Because losing happens everywhere, and it's going to, you know, he's going to face those moments. But how do the Sooners respond after a loss? I bring this up because hardly ever did Bob Stoops lose consecutive games. In other words, when they lost, which didn't happen often, the Sooners seemed to be resilient and bounced back. And that could very well be a measuring stick, fair or unfair, for Lincoln Riley to live up to in Norman, Oklahoma. Even though Lincoln is the head coach, he'll still be calling the plays. That part has not changed. But Baker Mayfield, well, he'll still be running the field. I mean, this guy, you know, physically, all the terrific elements of a quarterback you look for, but of course, mentally too, a very confident guy and a guy that is no doubt a leader for his teammates. Now, of course, you might remember during the offseason had an incident in Arkansas, but you know what? He's paid for it. He's apologized and he's ready to move on. And you might remember 2017 almost didn't happen for Baker in a Sooner uniform. Remember three years ago, transferred from Tech to Oklahoma, um, didn't get to play. And also, too, um, was not going to get that particular year of eligibility back. It was going to be 2015 and then 2016, and that was it. But he fought for it and ended up getting this 2017 one more shot. And he'll have a shot doing something that no other shooter starting quarterback has done, and that is try to win three straight Big 12 championships. And, you know, he is the most accurate quarterback in Sooner history. He's completed 69% of his passes for his career, and last year completed 71% of them. So Baker Mayfield, I would anticipate another fantastic year for him. And remember, you know, he's finished in the top four in the Heisman Trophy each of the past two seasons. Now, the backfield obviously um, will have some notable omissions. We're talking about uh, Samaje Pirine, left a year early, and uh, Joe Mixon only played two seasons. So both now in the NFL. But you've got some capable running backs that are, are uh, more – been able to keep Oklahoma a two-dimensional attack. Very important. Rodney Anderson, you know, he's capable of having an 1,100-yard type rushing season because of his physical tools that he brings uh, to this team. The speed, the strength, he could do it. Got to stay healthy, though, because the last two years, we've barely seen him play because of season-ending injuries, but so far so good entering um, September, and he's healthy. But Abdul Adams might get the majority of the carries first. And Adams, you know, didn't get a lot of touches last year because of P. Ryan and because of Mixon and because of the fullback, uh, Dimitri Flowers, who you get for another year. Um, but Abdul Adams, um, from what we've heard, probably one of the more improved players from last season to now. So another positive for the OU backfield. And we're going to see a couple of other guys, too, who were early enrollees for the Crimson of the Cream. Uh, Marcellia Sutton, who they got from the uh, JUCO ranks, JUCO All-American, uh, got some uh, playing time this past spring, as did uh, Trey Sermon, a freshman. So the backfield, again, do you have running backs in the same class as P. Ryan and Mixon? Of course you don't, but what you're looking for is quality and some depth. And right now it looks like the Sooners have both in that department. Wide receiver, of course, you lost the best of the bunch in D.D. Westbrook. I mean, the Bolitnikoff award winner, 1,500 yards in receiving. And remember, you know, the Sooners were, you know, at this time not long ago, were looking for a replacement for Sperling Shepard, who went on to the NFL, and they answered that. Now, am I saying that this next group's going to have another Bolitnikoff award winner? Yeah, very unlikely. But I think the number one guy entering this year is a guy who's proven himself, you know, from the SEC. 
No, he didn't play for Bob Stoops, but he played for Mark at Kentucky, and that is a Jeff Bidette. Uh, Bidette led the SEC in yards per catch with 21 per grab. Um, and he's not D.D. Westbrook, but he's got some of D.D.'s uh, physical characteristics and definitely some speed to add to that. So I think he will be the number one wideout target for Baker Mayfield to throw to. Uh, the leading returning receiver, if you don't count Mark Andrews, who we'll talk about in a second, is uh, Jeffrey Mead, now entering his final year. We saw him uh, play in nine games a year ago and have three touchdowns. Remember this name, Sooner fans, Marquise Brown. Marquise Brown is going to be a difference maker for this team. His speed is unbelievable. He's only 5 feet 11 inches tall, but we know that he has the capability of uh, making a lot of guys miss, good footwork, um, a Juco All-American, and he will be used as a receiver, but also, too, um, they'll use him on special teams. So don't be surprised if a few weeks from now, after watching this report, we're talking a lot about Marquise Brown. He could be that game-breaker that the Sooners are looking for in 2017. Um, Mikael Jones, you know, the former uh, Louisiana product who had several SEC schools to keep in mind for his future play, decided to take Oklahoma. Last year, though, did not get a, a lot of action, but that should change entering this year. Of course, you have A.D. Miller uh, back as well, but no Nick Basquin, unfortunately, um, the walk-on from Norman North, who did terrific things last year, especially at the end of the season, um, you know, got hurt during August practices, and he won't be playing this year. So that is a notable loss. Of course, Mark Andrews, uh, the All-Big 12 tight end from a year ago, he's listed as a tight end, but he'll be playing in the slot, let, let, let's face it, because, you know, he's a very uh, valuable commodity in the red zone. In fact, 14 touchdowns for his career, 6 feet 5 inches tall, had 7 TDs. Um, a year ago, and he is a security blanket for Baker Mayfield. Last year had a little bit of issue with the shoulder at the end, but he's healthy and on par for 2017. So I can hear people shouting at me right now. Why are you so optimistic about this Oklahoma offense? After all, they lost P. Ryan, they lost Vixen. No, by the way, the best receiver last year in all college football in D.D. Westbrook. Why are you so hopeful that this offense can still be terrific? Here's why. Offensive line had a damn good 2016. You returned all of them and quality backups who started some a year ago. That's why. You can go about eight deep at least with this team up front. Hey, you're going to be a terrific offense even if you did lose you know, some of your big playmakers from the year before. And you got Orlando Brown anchoring this unit. Guy could have left after this past year. You know, He's played two years for the team but has been with the program for three years has started every game he's played in. That's 26 out of 26 starts, an All-American 6'8 and 345. It could be his last year because, again, like I've mentioned before, uh, left tackles are a very hot commodity in the NFL. So you know his services definitely are going to be very well wanted next year, even though he could play next year at Oklahoma if he so desires. Left guard position, second team all been 12 a year ago in Ben Powers. Um, Started 10 games last year, played in 11. The center position, you're secure there with Eric Wren, honorable mention. All Big 12 again. The accolades just don't stop for this offensive line. Um, played in 12 games, started in 10. He's a senior. A junior in Drew Samia, the right guard spot. Started all 13 games last year and for his career, 22 complete starts. And then right tackle, Bobby Evans, last year as a redshirt freshman, uh, played and started in every game except for one. And don't forget that you got Jonathan Alvarez. You know, he's a backup center. And he started some too. Cody Ford can play the left or right guard position. So you've got proven players on the offensive line. Again, they're just as responsible for OU scoring 41 plus last year as the skilled players. Now, you do lose, though, Alex Dalton. They were going to have him this year, but got hurt um, in the early stages of August practice. So unfortunately, he's out for the season. But again, the offensive line. Um, them or Alabama, you can take your pick. Um, who has the best offensive line in college football, but at least OU is in that discussion. Well, defensively, we know that Mike Stoops' squad had a very long September with those losses to Houston and Ohio State, and even in victories after that against TCU, Texas, and Texas Tech, defense didn't always look their part. And trust me, even though you'll say, okay, the secondary, they were ranked outside the top 100 and past D, it was all their fault. Trust me, the defensive line was just as responsible for not getting to the quarterback near enough. All right? So you know that a change had to be made, and they are switching to a 4-3 defense to 
you know, try to increase that pressure, okay? Now, the rush defense last year was real good uh, by Big 12 standards. It was one of the tops in the league and in the upper half in college football. They gave about 160 yards of rushing per game. I expect a good year from Neville Gallimore, whom, from what I'm hearing so far about the August practices, uh, probably has been uh, the most impressive of the bunch um, up front as far as that interior. Uh, Neville Gallimore, um, a year ago, six starts, had 40 tackles. Again, I think he's going to have a spectacular season. Matt Romar brings plenty of experience to the table. A senior last year played nine games but missed four due to injury. Really watch for the defensive end spots. DJ Ward, he's a veteran. Be his fifth year for this team. Redshirt senior. Um, started four games last year. Played in 12. And again, I mentioned that 4-3 uh, alignment. This should really help out. This should help out the secondary as well. When you can get Oboe, a corner crow, more involved in that backfield. A traditional linebacker, but he'll play the jack defensive end spot. Second team all Big 12 a year ago. And uh, for his career, 13 sacks. Last year had 71 tackles and a couple of picks. Linebackers, even though you lose the leading tackler in Jordan Evans up the middle, I still think this is going to be the strongest layer for Oklahoma in terms of that defense, even though they're going to uh, three linebackers instead of four, which we've seen for quite a while. Um, in the middle, the guy that's really getting a lot of praise so far, and we're going to get to see him um, shine early, and that's the uh, newbie in Kenneth Murray out of Missouri City, Texas. He'll play that Mike position. And other than Gallimore, probably the guy that has impressed the most so far in practices in terms of the D is Kenneth Murray. Emmanuel Beal, he returns. He'll play that will linebacking position, um, 81 tackles a year ago. Amazing. And the guy whose, you know, price really went up as far as how he could play toward the end of the season, he started those last six games, was Caleb Kelly, the one-time five-star recruit out of Fresno, California. And you have John Michael Terry. Um, a redshirt freshman who I also think will be in that mix, the former Tulsa product. And, you know, there's there's backups in that you know front seven as well, Addison Gumps, who I think will break through in the lineup. Amani Bledsoe, you know, if he can stay out of trouble, um, that'll be big for him to be involved in that defensive line. And a defensive end out of uh, Tulsa Memorial in Isaiah Thomas. I think that he will see PT as well. Of course, we mentioned the secondary. Um, they got better in the month of November, but of course, September, October, it was a nightmare. But one guy that really held his own, and quarterbacks didn't throw to his side too often, was Jordan Thomas. First team, all Big 12. I mean, the accolades speak for themselves. Had a couple of picks, and he's back. And again, I think that side is secured. But of course, that other spot, the other corner, that's where OU is a big-time mortal. And hopefully, Parnell Motley can fill that void. This is a guy that had one impressive spring, probably the star of the spring game. And I know it's not quite the same as a regular game, but when you have a guy that has that makeup speed and ability to make things happen at the corner, um, maybe OU has solidified that spot finally on the side opposite of Thomas Parnell Motley. Like what I've seen from him so far. Safety position, back for another year, Stephen Parker. He started from his freshman year, the strong safety, the former standout from Jinx. Um, you know, 39 games. He's played, he's played every game so far since his freshman year and has started in 30 of them. Honorable mention, all Big 12 a year ago. The other safety, well, Will Sutherland, I'd be shocked if he ever plays for this team again. It's really sad because, you know, he had these moments, especially last year uh, against Texas, but Sutherland's had off the field problems. You can Google it uh, to get more specific about it. I don't have enough time to talk about it right now, but uh, Sutherland suspended from the team as a result of off the field issues. And again, it's unlikely that he'll ever play for OU again, but I've been wrong before. So now Will Johnson, the former nickelback, will now play the free safety spot. The nickelback for right now, when OU does go to five defensive backs, looks like will be a freshman in Robert Barnes. But doesn't matter if you're a freshman you know, or a senior, doesn't matter what your classification is. If you can play, you can play. And that's what Mike Stoops is going to uh, go with. And Ruffin McNeil, uh, you might remember he used to be uh, Lincoln Riley's boss. Well, now it's role reversal as McNeil will coach that uh, defensive line. He's got years of experience, of course, with Texas Tech and as the head man of East Carolina throughout much of the 2000 teens. Special teams, well, he does it all except the windows. Maybe he does the windows too. I don't know. Austin Seibert, uh, once again, expected to be the starting punter and place kicker last year, 41 yards per punt. Um as far as place kicking, in 2016, made 68% of his field goals, which was a little bit down um, from what he had in 2015, which was in the high 70 percentile. And we mentioned um, earlier some of the players um, on the receiving side, but will also have an impact as far as returning kicks. Um, you know, Marquise Brown, expect him to be active 
as far as a punt returner, possibly kick returner too, and you'll also see Marcellius Sutton as well. The first two games on the OU schedule will be nationally televised dates, and that will include the UTEP game against the Miners. Should be very little difficulty for the Sooners in this one. It should also be Lincoln Riley's first win. Barring something unforeseen, the Sooners should extend the nation's current longest winning streak to 11 games, entering Columbus, Ohio, against Ohio State, who play at the Horseshoe. They say that Horseshoes bring you luck. Well, the Sooners, you have a feeling they're going to need more than luck to beat one of the top teams in the country. And of course, we know about last year, the Buckeyes had their way with the Sooners in Norman. The following week, September 16th, Tulane, that game's on pay-per-view. My thoughts on pay-per-view, I hate it. Big time. There you go. <laughs> September 23rd, the Big 12 opener against Baylor, whose offense might give OU some problems, but Baylor's lack of depth will hurt him in this one. October 7th at home against the Cyclones. Iowa State has not beaten OU in 27 seasons. Then the following week, we get Lincoln Riley versus Tom Herman, two guys who weren't even head coaches at these schools a year ago. But they'll meet for the first time at the Cotton Bowl in Big D, second Saturday of October. Last year's game could have gone either way. The Sooners came out on the winning end. Let's hope the same thing happens again. October 21st at Kansas State, Texas Tech at home the following week. Sooners should win that one and should win it handily. Then November 4th, perhaps the Big 12 game of the year against Oklahoma State, also a top 10 squad. Playing this game a little bit earlier than normal. November 4th. And I think it's going to be two matchups between these squads. I think the second matchup will be for the Big 12 Championship in early December. November the 11th, TCU at home. I think the Horn Frogs will be a challenge, but not the following week against Kansas. Miles will be a bye week, November 18th. And then the finale, sensational quarterback Will Greer in West Virginia will come to Gaylord Memorial Stadium. Vegas says 9.5 wins for the center test projection. I'm going to go just a little bit higher at 10. Look, I think OU will play better against Ohio State this time. I just don't think it's going to be enough. And I'm curious if the defense as a whole has gotten a lot better. They'll be better, but have they gotten a lot better? If so, I think an upset's possible in Columbus, but right now I'm not leaning that way. And I do think there's going to be one Big 12 loss, probably in Stillwater against Oklahoma State. Regardless, I think the Sooners and the Cowboys will finish 1-2 in the Big 12 and will meet early December in Arlington, like I mentioned earlier, for the Big 12 championship. I'll have my pick on that game, plus my pick on the other major conference championships and the four teams that I think will go to the college football playoff who meet the championship game and win it August 30th on my college football playoff preview show. Please check it out. Thanks for watching at Boomer Center.